morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay? Yes. All right, you can hear me well. Now, we have a very limited time this morning. I have a challenge ahead of me. I have about 14 minutes to cram in an hour and a half presentation. Think it can be done? Right. We're going to try it. We're going to try it. Um, we may not have as much interaction as I would like, but I, I do want your, your input, so please feel free. Um, if we don't finish the presentation, there are comprehensive notes that go along with this presentation, so you can get what you don't get this session in the notes to come. Okay? All right, now we we're looking at uh, breaking the cycle. And uh, breaking the cycle, the idea behind breaking the cycle is. Um, Shedding the chains of, of, of negative past experience. Anybody here had any negative past experiences? Yes. Every single one of us. And so we're going to look at how we can break the cycle. We're going to use Hezekiah um, as, uh, as an illustration. Now Hezekiah, I'm going to be preaching about him um, shortly, so we're going to be using him as an illustration for what we're going to be teaching today. Second Chronicles 29 from verse 3. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. Then he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them in the east square. Said to them, Hear me, Levites, now sanctify yourselves. Sanctify the house of the Lord, your, uh, the Lord God of your fathers and carry out the rubbish from the holy place. So this is Hezekiah. Hezekiah was called to be king at the young age of 25. The Bible says of his father, Ahaz, he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, yea, and made his son to pass through the fire according to the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel. So, here we see Hezekiah coming from a, a, a very negative background. I don't know what it does to an individual to know that their father has made their son to pass through the fire. So Hezekiah knows that his father has sacrificed his brother in some kind of heathen, pagan ritual. Now what that would do psychologically to an individual, I do not know. But we know that the Bible gives us a principle. Numbers 14, verse 18, the Bible says, The Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression. Sounds good? Amen. It goes on. But he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Now, does that sound fair? No. Go ahead. Um, keep that in mind, because we're going to make that point as we go through. And if I don't make the point, remind me about that. Because it's vitally important, the point that you are raising. So, the Bible is, is indicating here that the children will suffer the consequences of their parents' actions. Yeah? And that it doesn't read, doesn't sound fair, does it? I mean, it is innocence suffering because of the actions of other people. But what, what the text is actually saying here is not that God arbitrarily punishes the children for what the parents have done, but what this is talking about is the natural consequences of our upbringing. Okay? And we're going to illustrate that point as we go through. Now, let's look at some examples. Family of Abraham. Now, family of Abraham, Abraham and Sarah have uh, children. What are their names? And? Okay. Good relationship or bad relationship? Bad relationship. So there's, there's problems with the brothers. Um, and as a result, I mean, we know that the, 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 the kind of soap opera-like uh, uh, shenanigans in the family of Abraham, at the end of the day, there is favoritism on the part of both parents. One favors Ishmael, the other favors um, Isaac. And as a result, what happens? One has to leave the camp. Okay. Now let's go down to the next generation. We see in the family of Isaac. Isaac has two sons. Their names are? 
Jacob and Esau. Good relationship, bad relationship? Bad relationship. Um, one is favored by the father, one is favored by the mother. And as a result, we see uh, deceit, we see deception, we see lies. And as a result, what happens within the family context in terms of there is separation within the family? Let's go down to the next generation. Jacob has sons, uh, 12 sons. And um, Joseph is the favorite. Good relationship with his brothers or bad relationship? It's a bad relationship with the brothers. And as a result, they, 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 uh, first they try to kill him, and then they sell him off into slavery. And so again, we see a pattern going through the families. There is separation from the family. So, so what are the traits we see? What are the familiar patterns we see going through? We've mentioned them. We see split. Favoritism. Lies and deceit. Sibling rivalry and expulsion. So we see a pattern going down through the family relationships. Let's look at another example. Look at the family of Jesse. Jesse, the father of David. Um, good man, bad man? Well, we're not told much about him. But the little that we do read, it appears that he was a very good man. And David, good king, bad king? Um, yeah. <laughs> Okay, David, as a king, he was probably the best king that Israel ever had. But um, there were some problems. And we see a, a depiction of, of his encounter with Bathsheba. And uh, we know that the, the, the issues that David has, he had several wives, several concubines. Um, and then what do we see in the next generation? Solomon. Solomon had uh, how many wives? 700 wives, 300 concubines, was it? <laughs> and, and what we see with David, David's marriages were, were basically political in order to keep peace within the region. And, so, and as a result of the marriages which he had, these, these uh, unions with uh, pagan nations, um, paganism comes into the experience of Israel. In the next generation with Solomon, Solomon has so many wives and concubines, so we see an escalation of idolatry within the nation. We go down to the next generation, Rehoboam. Rehoboam, by this time, he goes hook, line, and sinker into idolatry. And he also has many wives and many concubines. So we see a pattern going down through the generations. They confirm what the Bible tells us. This third and fourth generation thing is significant. That what we, what we live, we pass down to future generations. Listen to this, Patriots and Prophets 306. Wrong tendencies, perverted appetites, and debased morals are transmitted as a legacy from father to son to the third and fourth generation. Now, there seems to be something significant about this third and fourth generation thing. It represents a period of about 300 years. Um, have you heard of a, of a slave owner called William Lynch? William Lynch was a slave owner who came up with a strategy for keeping black people enslaved. And his strategy was, was this. Liberate the body, but keep the mind. In other words, if you can, can distort the thinking of an individual, you can give them physical freedom, but yet they will not access that freedom because they are slaves in their minds. Why was it Bob Marley uh, sang about um, was it emancipate your mind from mental slavery? Something like that. Um, never allow the males to settle. So keep them breeding and moving on. And it's significant the patterns that we see today in the way that, that, that uh, some males uh, relate to their families, you know. Have, have children, move on. Have more children, move on. We see a pattern going down through the generations. Uh, create a false illusion of life. You know the concept of the, the house slave and the field slave. The house slave, you know, if, if the house was burning down, they would say, our house is burning down. Because they'd bought into the, the mindset that they and their masters are, are one. Um, destroy their ability to use language. <laughs> it was interesting, just this morning, uh, I was reading something that, that Bob, uh, not Bob, uh, Bill Cosby, um, was, was talking about the, the, the generation, his present generation of youth in, in America, about how they, they, don't, they can't speak English, you know, uh, where you be. 
uh, where you at, you know, uh, what, what he drives. <laughs> you know? And, and this, this language gives you access to, to power. So if you can keep people ignorant, you can keep them enslaved. Destroy their sense of identity. Once you lose your sense of identity, you lose your, your, your sense of direction, where you're going. And it's, what is interesting about all this is that William Lynch said this. He said, I guarantee every one of you that if installed correctly, it will control the slaves for at least how long? 300 years, third and fourth generation. The slave, after receiving this indoctrination, shall carry on and will become self-refueling and self-generating for hundreds of years, maybe thousands. So what he recognized, what the Bible also recognizes, is that once we hand down a legacy to future generations, that legacy will perpetuate itself unless something intentional happens to break the cycle. So what we are living today, if we, the, the negative things that we experience, if we don't want our children and our children's children to experience them, we have to deal with them now. Conversely, the positive things that we are experiencing, if we want our great-grandchildren to experience them, we need to perpetuate them. So break the cycle. First step in breaking the cycle is to cultivate self-awareness. Now, what is self-awareness? Know who you are. Know who you are. Understand who you are. And then self-awareness leads to a, an ongoing attention to our internal states. So what we are thinking, what we're feeling, it's, it's a knowledge of who we are, what makes us tick. Uh, a couple of passages, well, one passage from two Bible versions, Isaiah 51.1, listen to me, you who follow after righteousness. Are you following after righteousness? Well, three of you are. You who seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the hole of the pit from which you were dug. In NIV it says, listen to me, you who pursue righteousness and who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were cut and, the, and to the quarry from which you were hewn. So Isaiah indicates to us here that if you are in pursuit of righteousness, if you want to get to know God and experience his righteousness, one of the key things that we need to do is to understand where we come from, understand our origins. One of the things that I stress, particularly when I'm doing um, uh, premarital counseling, is the, the, the importance of understanding our family of origin. Because what we live in our marital experience is oftentimes uh, we play out what we observed and what we experienced in our family of origin. So we need to understand where we come from. Uh, Winston Churchill once said, the farther backward you can look, the farther forward you will see. So we need to understand who we are and what makes us tick. Somebody once said that the longest journey you will ever take is the journey within. And a lot of people don't want to take that journey. Why? You might not like what you see. Uh, somebody, a guy called John Powell, as a psychologist, wrote a book called Why Am I Afraid to Tell You Who I Am? And he asked, he did a survey, asked a question. And the, one of the responses that came back was, if I tell you who I am and you don't like who I am, that's all I have. So sometimes we don't, we don't like what we see on the inside, and so we create what, what the ancient Greeks called a persona. A persona was a, was a mask that the actors used to wear. And the persona is that image that we portray to the world as, as how we would like to be seen rather than who we actually are because we don't like the reality. So that's why the longest journey you will ever take is the journey within. It's, a, it's the journey to, uh, to self-understanding. Take an honest look at who you are. Because only when you accept who you are can you begin to, to free yourselves from the negativity that comes from our past. David says, Psalm 139, verse uh, 23, 24, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me to the way everlasting. Now, 
when David said to God, search me, was he inviting God to know something that God didn't already know? Of course not. God knows everything. So what was David doing here? Why, 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 why is he saying, search me, when God already knows? He's confessing what he's done. He's confessing what he's done? Yeah. Anybody else? What is he doing here? Yeah. Confronting his guilt. Yeah. Is this? Yeah. Same point. Face to face contact. Let's talk. It's good to talk. David is coming to God and saying, here am I, warts and all. And this is one of the most courageous prayers that you could ever pray. Because David here is asking God to reveal to him who he really is. If there is anything in me that is not like you, Lord, show it to me. So here is a David who is willing to confront the darkest, most mucky, nasty part of who he is so that he can allow God to deal with his business. This is a courageous prayer. And we need to come to a point where we're willing to be totally open with God because only when we are totally open with God can we even dream about being open with one another. Every family is dysfunctional. Do you agree? Yeah. No. Every living one of you came from a dysfunctional family. And how can I say that confidently without knowing most of you? Born in sin, shapen in iniquity. Dysfunction simply, dysfunctional simply means that it doesn't function exactly how, how it was intended to function. And because we are born in sin, shaped in iniquity, we will say things, do things, fail to do things, and hurt one another. The only difference is the degree of dysfunctionality. You don't have to be like the Simpsons in order to be dysfunctional. Much of what we discipline our children for, they learn from us. One of the things that, that the Lord showed me was that I, the times where I become most angry with my children is where I see things in them that remind me about... <laughs> I, 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 my son, most of all, because my son is like a... He, he, he is a mini-me. You know, he, he's like, I was him <laughs> at, at his age. And so oftentimes, we, we, the, our children, we're disciplining them, but listen, where did they get it? Oftentimes, they got it from us. It is inevitable that the children should suffer from the consequences of parental wrongdoing, but they are not punished for the parent's guilt. Except as they shall, uh, except as they participate in their sins. So in, in Ezekiel chapter three, it talks about this: that that we that children do not suffer the guilt of their parents' wrongdoing, but they will suffer the consequences. The Bible says of Hezekiah that he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. So in spite of the fact that he has a father who is a heathen, devil-worshipping, child-sacrificer, the Bible says that Hezekiah did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And that should give us encouragement. Because we are not determined by our past. We are influenced by our past, but we are not determined by our past, because we always have a choice that we can make. We decide whether or not we replicate the past or whether or not we break the cycle if it was negative. Yes. 
Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't want him to, to be me. I want him to be better than me. <laughs> so, yeah. So, we learned some lessons from Hezekiah, his experience. One of the first things he does um, when he um, was, was trying to get the nation back on the right footing, the first thing he did was to make a covenant with the Lord. It says, now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel. What is a covenant? It's an agreement. It's a promise. It's more than a contract. It's a heart agreement. It's an, a heart agreement that we make with the Lord or with another person. So, uh, he, he makes a covenant. And his covenant resulted in this. He began a work of reformation, rescued Judah from the fate of the northern kingdom, uh, restored the temple services, cleared the land of idolatrous shrines. And so, he made a commitment to to, to love the Lord and also to serve him with all his heart. Second step, get help. In verse 5 it says, Hear me, Levites, now sanctify yourselves, sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers. Who were the Levites? They were the priests. They were dedicated to God. Can you remember why, why the Levites? Yeah, why were they chosen? But the, the, the reason why they were chosen in the first place goes back to um, the, the uh, Mount Sinai, yes. the, 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 um, the idolatry which took place there. The Levites were the ones who were faithful, and so they were given the responsibility of being the spiritual leaders within, within the nation. And so Hezekiah recognizes that he can't do this work by himself. So he enlists the help of the Levites. Now, if we are going to break the cycle of the past, we need to be prepared to ask for help. How many of you like asking for help? How many of you like helping people? Yes. <laughs> see, see we, 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 will help, we will help people. Some of us will help people until it hurts. But when it actually comes to receiving help, we have a problem with that. Because a lot of us don't want to admit that we, we have... Uh, weaknesses and deficiencies, and that we need help. Is that external in a conflict with the concept, conceptually of independence and seeking help? Yeah. There's a battle going on. Yeah, ab absolutely there's a battle. What God wants for us is not independence. He wants interdependence. So we, we depend on one another. That's, what he, that's why he has created the Christian community, that we might support one another. No, bear one another's burdens. Yeah. So, get rid of any hindrance to growth. Carry out the rubbish from the holy place. So, in order for us to get rid of the, the negativity from the past, we have to be intentional about clearing out the rubbish from the holy place. The, the, the house of God could not function effectively until they cleared out all the, the rubbish and the stuff that accumulated in the house of God. Now the Bible tells us that we are the temple of the living God. So if we want to experience righteousness, we too have a work to clear out the rubbish from the holy place. That's what David was doing. David was saying, search me. Show me the rubbish. Reveal it to me so that you can clear, clear it out. Hezekiah, the Bible tells us in 2 Kings, Hezekiah broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for until those days the children of Israel burned incense to it. Do you remember what the, bra the brazen serpent was all about? So, yeah, for healing. Serpents came into the camp, were biting people, and, and people were dying left, right, and center, and they go to the Lord and pray for deliverance. God says to Moses, this is what you do. You get a brazen serpent, you put it on a pole. Have you ever wondered why God said put a snake on a pole? Snake is a symbol of what? 
So why put, put a serpent on a pole? You ever wondered why? Again? Yeah. It's because, more than that, slightly more than that. Yeah, no. Bible says to us in 2nd uh, 2 Corinthians that Jesus was made to be sin for us who knew no sin. So, the serpent represents Jesus as the sin bearer. So that's why they were to look and be saved. But there are many people who didn't have enough faith to look. They stayed in their tents and died because they didn't have enough faith to just go and look. So this blessing which God gave to them for healing, what happened to it? It became an idol. It became an idol. People started worshipping the, the bronze serpent. So what did Hezekiah do? Got rid of it. Now do you think that was a courageous decision on his part? Do you think people were happy for him to take this, this thing which they were worshipping and to get rid of it? No, sir. He would have faced opposition. They, people probably wanted to take him and kill him. Get rid of him. But, but Hezekiah recognized that, listen, this thing which used to be a blessing is now an obstacle. So we need to get rid of it. There are blessings which the Lord has brought into our lives that maybe have become obstacles. I was listening to a sermon not so long ago and was talking about um, there is a danger that we can be negative of a, of, a, of a negative, we can be prisoners of a negative past. But he also said we can be prisoners of a positive past. Because we've experienced success back then, we think that, okay, because it worked back then, is it going to work today? But no, that was for back then. We need fresh experiences for today, new methods. So we need to be courageous in getting rid of things which, uh, Ellen White uses this phrase. She talks about, um, we hold on to what she calls our darling sins. You ever heard that phrase? Now, you wouldn't necessarily put those two things together, but we should, they're darling sins because we like them. We want to hold on, we cherish them, we want to hold on to them. But we need to take courage in order to get rid of the rubbish. All right. Bible says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. What does this mean? In practical terms, what does this mean? Put this in plain English so Joe, Joe, Joe Public can understand it. What, what is this text saying? Let, let the Christ, the, the, um, the Lord Jesus Christ, the shield of protection and everything, so the provision of the flesh may not overcome you. Okay, no, no, no. Joe Public. Talk to Joe Public. That's a nice theological explanation. <laughs> Okay, right, that's, that's good. That takes us very close to where we're going. Um, the text is basically saying, don't make it easy for you to sin. You know? T accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and, and don't make it easy for you to commit the sins which you like to commit. So if you, if you have a problem with, with alcohol, don't get in a pub. You know? If, if you happen, if you have a problem with pornography, put some of those, you know, controls on your computer. Don't make it easy for you to commit the sins that you know you are, have a weakness in that area. You'd read about a revival in Ephesus. One of the things they did in Ephesus was to get out all the, 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 the books, you know, the philosophical books and the, the devilish books and just burn them. Stuff that we need to get rid of. You know, when I, when I became a Christian, I got my whole record collection and just got rid of everything. And you know, I think, you know, I, the baby went out with the bathwater, but, you know. <laughs> but there needs to be a getting rid of stuff. Now, what, now, what is your rubbish? Your rubbish is different from my rubbish. Everybody has their own rubbish. Can you say genders is rubbish? I'm just checking. Good answer, good answer. I will remember.
remain non-committal. <laughs> no, it is rubbish. <laughs> All right, so remember also, breaking the cycle is not just about you. It's not just about you. Listen to this, verse 6. For our fathers have trespassed, for lo, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. So when we don't overcome, the people around us pay the price. It's a daunting thought. When we don't deal with our stuff, the people around us, our families, namely, pay the price. Every decision we make carries consequences. There is a ripple effect. Our children pay the price for what we fail to overcome. The, the principle of the third and fourth generation means that uh, what we don't overcome, our great-grandchildren will struggle with. What legacy are we handing down? Okay, set up barriers to keep you from going back. Um, you remember the, 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 the uh, story or the parable that Jesus tells about the, the individual who, out of whom a devil is cast out? And that devil goes and he finds seven others more wicked than himself and he comes back and finds the house swept and clean. And, the, and it ends up by saying that the last state of that man was worse than the first. It is not enough to stop doing bad things. We have to start doing the right things. We have to replace unrighteousness with righteousness. So we need to set up barriers to prevent us from going back. Because sometimes when we develop habits, it's like, I remember when we were at college, our, one of our professors gave us an illustration. He said, if you, if you take a nail and score it once across a piece of wood, and then try and go across that, that scar at, at a 90-degree angle, is that going to be difficult or hard? If you just scratch the wood and then try and go across it at 90 degrees, is it going to be easy or hard? Hard, hard. Easy? No, if you just scratch it once. It's going to be... Yeah, but if you just scratch it, it's not going to be that difficult with a bit of force. But if you take that nail and you go back and forth and back and forth until you create a groove and then try and go across it at 90 degree angle, what's going to happen? You're going to slip back into the old groove. So when it comes to breaking habits, we need to fill the groove. Get rid of it completely so that we don't go back into old habits. So you may overcome something, but if you don't set up barriers to prevent you from going back, you can find yourself going back into those same old habits. In the first year of his reign, in the first, uh, first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. So Hezekiah's first priority sought out the house of the Lord. Priority number one. And that's where we should always begin. Begin with our personal relationship with God. Here's a challenging one. Make yourself accountable. How many of you here have individuals or an individual in your life who you can tell your whole heart to, trusting that they will take what you give them and hold it precious? That they won't take your business and put it in the street. That they will accept you in spite of your failings and your weaknesses, and somebody who you are completely comfortable with holding yourself accountable to. Now, I'm not going to, I don't want you to indicate, I just want you to reflect on that. It won't be many. Many people only have one. A lot of people don't have any. But it's vitally important that we have people in our lives who will hold us accountable. I have two brothers, and we intentionally make ourselves accountable to one another. I have given them permission to get into my business. They have given me 
likewise permission. We had, we had, we, and it, it took a long time for us to get to that point. We sat down as brothers and we, we had a discussion about um, what is family? And we, we, we talked about you know, what family is, what it was really all about, openness, support, having each other's back, as the Americans say. And, and my, my second brother said, okay, if we're going to be family, let's be family. Let's, let's do this. Let's, let's be there for each other. So this is intentional. Keep. Oh, but you know what? In fact, I'm going to redress that point because it doesn't necessarily have to be in the blood. It was just that this was, you know, if it can be blood, good. You know, they say the blood is thicker than water, but yeah, I, I, I don't know about that. But, but I'm going to come and address that point as we, as we go on. This is one of the most courageous things you will ever do in your life. Is making yourself accountable to another individual. And as I said before, if you can't do it first with God, it's difficult for you to do it with anybody else. Unhealthy patterns of thinking and behavior grow under the cover of darkness. Like mold. Mold is one of the few things that can grow in darkness. In fact, if you expose mold to the light, you can kill it. So if you have unhealthy habits or patterns of thinking, one of the best things you can do to, to deal with it is to talk to somebody about it. Somebody you can trust. You don't tell your business to, to any and anybody. Make sure you find somebody who is trustworthy. Uh, care fronting. This is a, a, a phrase coined by Rob Parsons from Care for the Family. And uh, care fronting is caring enough to confront. The principle is speaking the truth in love. Many of us know how to speak the truth, you know, but do we know how to do it in love? We say what we want to say, how we want to say it, when we want to say it, just telling the truth. That's a challenge. <laughs> That's a challenge. What is, that, what is motivating what we are saying? Are we truly concerned for the other individual? Speaking the truth in love. Um, Hezekiah had Isaiah. Who do you have? The Bible says confess your faults one to another. Confess your faults one to another. That, and this, again, takes courage. Hold your hands up and say, listen, you know what? I'm sorry. The way I spoke to you, I shouldn't have said what I said in the way that I said it. Um, you know what? I, I, I've held a lot of things in my heart against you, and um, I want you to forgive me. That's not an easy conversation to have. That's relationship. Relationship is process. And it takes time to get to a place. Um, even within our closest relationships, in a, in, for example, in a marital relationship or, or a sibling relationships, you don't get there overnight. And it, sometimes it requires a process to create a safe enough place in that relationship where you are comfortable enough to share Many, many marriages, many family relationships don't have that safe place. Okay, the, you know, the, the blood thing. Um, and yet, the Bible says that he did what was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. Who was his father? Who was Hezekiah's father? Ahaz. Ahaz. When the Bible talks about David being his father, David was actually his great, 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 great grandfather. He had to go back 14 generations to find an example to follow. And David wasn't that great an example himself. But you know, I love the Bible. I love the Bible because the Bible, in spite of, you know, David messed up left, right, and center, and yet the Bible still says, man after God's own heart. Could you understand that? You know, Hezekiah 
messed up, and we'll talk about him during the, 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 the message this morning, messes up left, right, and center, and yet the Bible says, did what was right in the sight of the Lord. God has these, you know, he, he looks at us in terms of our potential and, and, and the good in us rather than the negativity. I love that about God. Um, but he had to go back 14 generations. Breaking the cycle is not a blame-laying exercise. It's not about recognize, it's not about saying, okay, well, well, well my father, you know, he, 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 he did this and he did that, and for you to go back and confront them and say, you didn't raise me right. No, no, no. Breaking the cycle is not about laying blame. Because when you start on the blame-laying route, it will take you all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Because everybody can blame somebody else. The, the break in the cycle is, is about simply recognizing where you have come from so that you can take responsibility for what is yours. Your future is not your past unless you choose to perpetuate the past. You decide what your future is going to be. You can't control what happens around you. You can't control what necessarily happens to you, but you control what happens in you. The choices that you make, how you respond. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So in spite of all the things that happened to us, listen, we can still be more than conquerors. He didn't just say conquerors. He says more than conquerors. The Bible talks in superlatives where, where, where sin abounds, grace much more abounds, super abounds. So, sorry. So breaking the cycle. Oh, we're not tuned too bad for time. Cultivate self-awareness. Self-awareness is an ongoing attention to your internal states, recognizing who you are, what makes you tick. Stop playing the blame game. You know, it takes you nowhere. Just stop and say, you know, what am I doing to perpetuate the negativity? Take responsibility for what is yours. Make a covenant with the Lord. Maybe that should be the first point. Start with your relationship with God. Make a covenant with God as to what you are going to do in order to deal with the negativity you have experienced. Clear out the rubbish. Identify in the first place. That requires you being honest with yourself. Doing a David. Search me, O Lord. Learn to forgive. And we could spend a whole we could spend a whole day, weekend, on the subject of forgiveness. Because what, what this is the mechanism that God has given us to deal with the negativity of our past. Because we have the capacity to remember but we don't have the capacity to change what's happened to us. And the mechanism God has given to us in order to deal with the negative emotions that accompany what has happened to us in the past is the process of forgiveness. Yeah, it's another seminar for another day. Cultivate your emotional intelligence. Last time I was here, we spent some time looking at what emotional intelligence is. Recognizing what you are experiencing, being uh, learning how to manage your emotions, recognizing your emotions in other people, learning how to deal with your relationships in a healthy way, and learning how to motivate yourself to accomplish your goals. Establish clear boundaries in your relationships. If you have experienced or are experiencing negative treatment from somebody or abusive um, relations with somebody, you are responsible for placing appropriate boundaries in place to stop the abuse, either separate yourself from that person emotionally or physically, and then put in place consequences that if it continues, this is, this is the action that's going to happen. So we need to put in place proper boundaries. Or? or you have to learn to forgive that person. Oh, yeah, but you need to, to forgive them anyway for your own benefit, not, not necessarily for them your own benefit. But the boundaries go along with. You forgive, but you need to put the boundaries in place. Uh, remember, it's not just about you. Protect the priority of your family. We're going to be talking about that in the, in the sermon. Claim the power of God to break the power of bondage. 
because he is the one that, that, that can free us from our past. The truth shall set you free. And wrap it up. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The problem with many of us is that we do the opposite. We forget the potential that lies ahead of us and we lay hold on those things which are behind. But Paul is saying to us here, listen, leave that stuff in the past. That's where it belongs. There is a, a guy called Charles Kettering who said, My, um, I like to focus on the future because that's where I intend to spend the rest of my life. So you remember the past, but just don't live there. Thank you for your attention. We, even before 11 o'clock, wow, God has given us grace. Thank you very much. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, for those of you who weren't here, there are comprehensive notes that go along with this presentation. So what you didn't get, you can get in the notes. I will make them available to Elder Gary in electronic form, and you sort yourselves out. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. God bless you.